Hi, Secreters. Welcome back to the Secret Deciphered Podcast. Um, I am wanting to talk about a few things. I'm so excited that Ben Asen is part of our group. Um, I can't even tell you. I love his photography and his artistry, and I'm so grateful that he's allowed all of us to be able to purchase prints um, from the book, uh, some of our favorites, things that we're personally connected to um, in some way through all of our secret research and the history research that we've done for this book and how it all ties together. And so thank you, Ben, for being a part of our group. And we are excited that you're here and that you're willing to share your gifts and your talents with us. I wanted to pop on here and say a few things about um, the content on the Facebook page and Instagram and Discord and Patreon is all my own um, videography and content. So I kind of keep it that way and I just wanted to make some folks aware who were trying to kind of post their own. I don't mind if you want to share videos about if you're at a location and you're wanting to talk about it or you want to upload PDFs or that kind of thing. But if you want to try to do your own deciphering channel, it's probably best to do that in your own space and that's okay. Um, so I have these photos around me today because they're representative of the French painting. And so I wanted to talk about the French painting for a few minutes because I know its gemstone is technically December, but we have to understand how um, it's potentially tied in to Mardi Gras. So it's a little twisted, right? So we have this painting for NOLA is the presumed city and we have the mask which is great because I know that you know Mardi Gras is coming up right like hey Mardi Gras <laughs> but this is even better because I got this one too and this kind of looks like the mask so it got me to thinking when I was at Party City the other day how relevant Mardi Gras may be to a French gem, right? Mardi Gras originally started in the United States in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile was the original site of the French uh, colony slash, you know, capital. <laughs> and they got a little weary of the landscaping and over a few years they moved the capital to New Orleans, as you guys know. But Mardi Gras originally started there and the basis of wearing the masks was to separate class distinction uh, from who the elites were, you know, you could go through Mardi Gras, the beginning of the Lenten season uh, celebration and put these masks on and embody a different spirit that you could be and you didn't have to be yourself. You couldn't be yourself. You were hiding yourself, essentially. And it was big back then because as it started and flourished and even Venice had their own um, Mardi Gras and still do. but you have different class levels of people putting on these masks and mingling and partying with one another as if it didn't matter if you were a pauper. And so the symbology there is really interesting. And not only the mask, but the clocks. So in several of the paintings there is a clock and most people think it's just there because it's giving you a month um, of when the gemstone is. And it's partially true. But 
it's also indicative of a newspaper. So when we think about the Boston painting and we think about how he, John Pellencard, painted the Boston Globe in the newspaper or in the painting, he's referencing that newspaper for a reason. And at that time in 1980, 81, 82, when this would have been put together, we know Bantam wasn't spending a bunch of money on, on uh, advertising and uh, content of the book. Uh, and even Ben has said, and John Palancar has said, you know, the, the book publishing, it just didn't do it enough justice. They just didn't want to give us enough money to really give the photos and the paintings their proper due. So they were enlarged and changed in some ways and manipulated to fit in the book a little more cheaply. And one of the key things that we can think about is how they would have utilized their advertising for the secret book, and that would have been by newspaper. So if you're a kid hanging out in Boston and you want to play this secret game puzzle hunt book, and you're going, oh, but there's 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 a globe. It looks like a bee. Hmm, Boston Globe, right? Makes sense. So because you would have used newspapers to advertise. And we know that Byron has done several interviews over time. We don't see any on uh, television. We see them in print. So it would have been through newspapers. Also at that time, the National Lampoon's uh, magazine was huge, uh, had a huge following. And obviously, Joellen and Ben and other artists had, had done pieces or artwork or photographs for this magazine. Got its start at Harvard, by the way. It was a lampooning magazine back in the day. Transformed into a really popular pop culture magazine similar to Mad Max, Playboy. It was It was the rage then, right? And obviously, National Lampoon's put out a lot of talent because at that time when you had Ted Mann um, doing some writing and Sean Kelly doing some writing and getting some original credit for bringing on certain actors and people doing these skits and um, on audio and then moving on to what became SNL right Chevy Chase, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, you know Gilda Radner, um, the list goes on, right? It's that era, it's that time frame. But the key thing to remember is when we're looking at these paintings, not only is the clock giving us when the essential month in gemstone is, it's also inferring a newspaper. So we have to remember that. And you have to think about different newspapers that have the times in their name. For instance, with NOLA, we have the Picayune Times, right? Picayune was started back in the 1800s. Picayune, the word itself, um, used to mean, and still kind of does, but it's essentially its foundational meaning was that it was a monetary amount. It was, it was five cents. It was half a dime. Uh, in the Spanish language. And then in today's common English, if you call it that, as Byron says, um, it indicates diminutive and something that's not worth much. <laughs> so the Picayune Times was the largest circulated newspaper um, in New Orleans. And and then we think about foundationally who started that newspaper and how it then went on to be a democratic newspaper and with all the history of NOLA, you know, we have, even with Mardi Gras, the class distinctions. And, and I think that's a really great message underneath it all, too, because even no matter what immigration group we talk about, there are always these highlights about people who have been pushed aside in society, pushed down, considered less than, 
And so it has a lot of meaning in that way. And I, and I don't know if people think about that when they're looking at the puzzles. I do. Uh, because it would make more sense too if you want to sell books that you would publish your advertisements in a lot of newspapers that have a large following and particularly in larger bigger cities right newspaper advertising at that time was a lot less expensive than television um, and really probably commonly in some ways still kind of is <laughs> if you can find them because mostly everything's digital now but these are things you got to think about, you know, when you put your 1980s glasses on, you got to go back and you got to go, hmm, you know, what, what was Byron thinking then? And, you know, how, how could they afford to advertise for the sale of this book? How are you going to get people interested, right? And so from talking with people who know Byron well, especially Ben, he was uh, an extremely intelligent man. Uh, and probably if we saw his SATs and maybe an IQ score would probably be up there around genius level. So what this means is he's utilizing these pieces of what would have been current time to get your attention to the focus area. And even whenever we're thinking about NOLA being French, I know there's some people that think, well, wait, no, wait, the French cask, oh, I'm thinking maybe Montreal, or I'm thinking Toronto, or, you know, nobody's looked at Maine, and there's a whole lot of Acadians up there still, and they still speak the French language. Um, but why he would have put the French gemstone for December? Why not February? Because overall, oftentimes, except for this year, because the way the dates fall, Mardi Gras is March 1st, but often, more often than not, it falls in February. So why are the German gemstone and the French gemstone in reverse? So then that means we're thinking along the lines of what the historical message is. And we all know why December is so important for Normandy, right? World War II. Uh, to me, that speaks hugely for that history. So Byron doesn't want you to forget it. He wants you to know it and tie it in. And I'm grateful for that because I love the hunt and I love the history more importantly than anything the history has been so great to learn and uh, I'm sure you guys are all aware of that too and and probably feel the same way and it can be daunting um, it's like following an Albert Einstein puzzle you know literally we're at this level of genius that it's gonna take a lot of deep thought and a lot of putting on your 80s glasses to go back and think on the way he saw things, the way he processed things, um, and what was the message that he was trying to convey. And we'll get to the German painting too, but I wanted to also point out some things about people saying, well, you know, Karen, it's the second verse is for Nola. I mean, it talks about Sarmiento and he was in New Orleans and he was talking about the St. Charles Hotel. And that may be true. Um, but what I find fascinating about Sarmiento is I have his, his diary here in front of me and, and what he wrote about New Orleans because he was only there for one night. And so that could maybe tie into the fact that he was saying they build palaces to shelter your head for a night, right? Like this grand hotel that I'm going to stay at. And by the way, remember Sarmiento was a staunch abolitionist. He believed that we absolutely needed to get rid of slavery, that we are no different than the mother country of England because they still had the peasantry system, which funnily enough kind of falls into that whole wearing a mask in Mardi Gras and being able to mix in the lower class levels of people that aren't Bill Gates and whoever else, right? 
Like, you could be a dishwasher and put on your mask and party with, you know, the various wealthy people. So, Sarmiento was saying, this is not this class distinction stuff that you got going on, like with the slaves is wrong still. Like if you really want to be a good, solid, democratic republic of a country, this has to go. But the night he was in New Orleans. So he was there November the 4th. And some people may, and maybe Byron was looking at that month, maybe a whole host of things that this could mean, right? You know, well, wait, November. Wait, if he was there in November, is he talking about the November painting? I don't know, you tell me. But number, nonetheless, November 4th, he paid uh, 50 cents for unloading at New Orleans. Because remember, he had just come from Cincinnati and he did this world tour, right? He was uh, on our world tour, more like the American tour. But he went all over Washington, D.C., met with Lincoln, um, went to Boston, went to New York, went to Montreal. Um, but the last night before he boards a ship to Havana, Cuba, he spends 50 cents on four summer frock coats which were a long, kind of long-pocketed coat. And he bought six shirts for seven cents a piece, a half a dozen socks, some shoes. He paid 50 cents for a bath. I won't even go there. Uh, $2 for the passport to Havana and a dollar for baggage to the port. The P. Soleil sailing boat for Havana. And then, of course, he had to pay a coach to go look for his diary of expenses that he wound up figuring out he never lost, but had to tip him 75 cents anyway. So here's the guy heading off to Havana, Cuba, talking about New Orleans, and, and we have to wonder what does it mean, right? When people say, and and it is said in the book that fairy secrets come in twos. I think there's a good solid two. But I also think there could potentially be a third. And I know some of my secreters have been talking about that on Facebook. And um, it might have been Marsha. Um, but, you know, there are these other subgroups of immigrants. And this is a key one. This is Spanish, right? We know New Orleans was Spanish territory at one point in time before it was wrestled away, you know, and then became an all out kind of English, French. The French then took over the French. I mean, the French claim to this day still New Orleans is their, really their, their American capital, right? Like if they have one here in the United States. Uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, there's still a lot of the, the French Acadian language that's spoken there. We have, um, well, in the course, New Orleans is actually named after the, after the Duke of Orleans, Orleans, um, not a king. And it's important to note that too, because in the secret book, when he's talking about a couple of the French kings, we're talking about King Louis the 16th and King Louis the 14th. Uh, each one of them named after polar opposite cities. Um, of course, we know one of them got the guillotine. The other was the Sun King, the longest reigning monarch uh, France ever had. And I think the longest reigning monarch in history of monarchy in itself. Although Queen Elizabeth given the Sun King Louis a run for his money <laughs> currently. But these things are knowledge that Byron just, he knew. He knew because he read so much and he absorbed history like a sponge. And this is what's going to get us to the next cask. 
being able to know the history well enough that you can apply the history plus the hints and the visual clues, right? Thanks to Ben and JJP and Joellen and all tying it together for us. So I'll leave you with that, but I just wanted to point out that it's all interesting how these clocks and the masks are very representative of that area. And by the way, speaking of class levels in New Orleans, whenever they were really getting into the height of ritualistically celebrating Mardi Gras, the African American community, you know, they wanted to participate as well and they made their masks and they could not afford the beads that were being distributed around so they handed out coconuts as a part of the Zulu crew because you have the various crews which were technically the various classes of people right and I find that interesting and so if you're in Mardi Gras and you go down and someone hands you a coconut you'll know it's from the Zulu tribe uh, and that's that's even some more really great history so I'm gonna be back we're gonna talk more about the paintings we kinda jump from kind of uh, theory to theory and uh, visual hint to visual hint and we're gonna talk about the German painting but it's really important to note how these all are similarly tied together and the history behind it. So um, until next time, we'll chat some more. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down on the feed. Um, I try to answer everybody and get back to everybody and it's getting a little crazy, but I'm, I'm doing my best. And and we can talk about it and we can understand together and learn together as a community um, what this fun, great educational book puzzle is teaching all of us. So don't forget, pay attention to your clocks, pay attention to the times, because that's what it is, the times. See where it leads you. You guys have a fabulous week. Very on.